Hi, and welcome to the third and final session of the Wise Mind Practice Series. My name is Jessie Larson Lee, and my pronouns are she, her, and I will be going through today's session with you all. Um, today's session does cover a lot of material, so feel free to take breaks um, throughout if you do need, um, and then you can come back to it later. Um, as mentioned in the previous sessions, there is a workbook for each of these sessions, so if you have that, you can follow along in that way. Um, if you don't have the workbook, that's okay too. I will be showing the exercises on the screen, so you can do it that way as well. All right, let's get started. Okay, so as I said today, we are covering emotion regulation. Um, so our goals for today are to challenge some of the myths. Um, that we have about emotions, talk about how emotions are useful, discuss ways to reduce your vulnerability to unpleasant emotions, and some steps for dealing with those unpleasant emotions when they do come up. Okay, so emotions, they are signals within your body to tell you what's happening. So for example, when something, is, something good is happening, you feel pleasant emotions, when something distressing is happening, you tend to feel those unpleasant emotions. Your initial reactions to what is happening around you um, are called primary emotions. So those are the strong feelings that come on quickly and don't involve having to think about what's happening. So for example, um, someone that you care about passes away, you feel sad. When you see something you haven't seen for a long time, you feel excited. Um, on the other hand, the secondary emotions are emotional reactions to your primary emotions. Um, so they are feelings about your feelings. So for example, you initially get mad at your roommate for not um, doing the dishes. Later on that day, you start to feel guilty about getting so angry at, at them. Um, it's also possible to feel several secondary emotions in response to a single primary emotion. For example, um, you feel anxious about an exam that's coming up. Um, as the day gets closer, you start to feel embarrassed or sad as you think about how anxious you're getting. You might feel mad at yourself um, that you can't seem to study much. And then the day after your exam, you start to feel guilty that you made such a big deal about it. Um, so essentially, you can see your primary emotional reaction can set off a long chain um, of those secondary emotions that often feel almost worse than that original emotion. Um, so you can sort of see why it's important to learn how to identify that original primary emotion so that you can um, proactively cope with that feeling before starting to feel overwhelmed by the secondary emotions. So today we're gonna to talk about some emotion regulation skills that can help you cope with those, those feelings. Okay, so let's talk about the purpose of emotions. Emotions first um, communicate to others what is happening for us. <clears throat> so our facial expressions are, are usually those immediate nonverbal ways of communicating our emotions. They're hardwired in us, so they're um, sort of that biological um, response and often communicate even faster than words. Emotions also motivate our behavior. The urge to act that is connected to specific emotions is often hardwired. So emotions prepare us for action. They save us time in getting us to act in important situations um, so we don't have to think everything through. For example, if you see your best friend about to walk into a dangerous situation, um, you will feel an emotion, most likely fear. Um, and this emotion will prompt you to stop them. You don't have to stop and think about the situation, you just do it. <clears throat> so in that way, um, emotions really help us overcome obstacles in our environment. So another example is when you feel anxious before a test, even though it feels uncomfortable, that um, anxiety can help motivate you to study so that you do well on that test. Um, emotions also give us information about a situation or event. They can be signals or alarms that something is happening. So when we feel happy, it might be telling us that 
um, we should keep doing what we're doing. When we feel mad, it might be telling us that we have been violated in some way or we need to reestablish boundaries. That being said, we do have to be careful um, because when carried to an extreme, emotions can be treated as facts and that um, is not always useful. Um, for example, we might think if I feel competent, then I am competent. Or if I feel right about something, it is right. If I feel afraid, the situation is threatening. Um, and that's, that's not always true, right? Like when we don't feel competent, that doesn't always mean that we aren't competent. Or if something feels right, it's not always right. Um, so learning how to recognize your emotions and their impact on your life is the first step to managing um, those high intensity emotional reactions. Um, that we tend to have, and it helps us be a better communicator. Um, some people pay very little attention to their emotions and maybe have learned to kind of tune out from those emotions. As a result, they're missing out on an important source of information that can help guide their responses and decisions. Other folks might struggle a little bit more with that feeling of overwhelm from emotions. Um, and by the time they've recognized what happened um, and what their emotions were telling them, it might be too late to kind of address it. So let's um, practice focusing on identifying our feelings. Um, so the following page, we have a, a feelings list. So if you want to take a look at this, um, and if you do have the workbook, you can find this as an exercise. So if you wanna look through, this is a long list of feelings, but if you wanna look through and circle some of the feelings that you felt in the last few days. Um, so work on identifying that. You can pause this if you need a second to go through this and find some of those emotions and then come back. Okay, so after circling some of those feelings, what do you notice? What do you notice about maybe what emotions have been coming up in the past few days? And let's, let's do another exercise um, by choosing a feeling that you're, you're a little bit less familiar with and complete this exercise here. So identifying that feeling and then going through this. Um, what does this feeling want? What does this feeling need? What is it afraid of? What does it feel like? Taste like, smell like? Okay. So moving on from that, um, I'm gonna work, do another exercise here. Um, so as we've been talking about this, this need to be able to, um, slow down and slow down that emotional process so that it can be examined is sort of that first step, um, to be able to start to manage some of that sense of overwhelming emotional reactions. Um, once it has been examined, you might be able to make some different decisions that might feel a little bit better to you. Um, so this next exercise will help you begin this process by examining a situation that has already happened. So try to think about a recent event where you had an unpleasant emotional reaction. So some of those unpleasant feelings um, and then fill out this next worksheet um, and just try to be, try to be honest um, to help make it more effective. So this is the Recognizing Your Emotions worksheet. So it asks some of these questions. When did the situation happen? What happened? Why do you think it happened? Um, how did that situation feel, both emotionally and physically? And this is your chance to maybe try and pick apart some of those primary versus secondary emotions here. Um, to see if you can identify that, that primary emotion in that situation. And then those physical sensations too, right? Like, where did you feel it in your body? Was your chest tight? Um, did you feel a lump in your throat? Did you feel shaky? 
And then moving on to what did you want to do as a result of what you felt? So what was that kind of urge? Did you have the urge to um, hang up the phone? Did you have the urge to run away? Um, and then what did you actually do and say? So what were those actions or behaviors you engaged in based on how you felt? Um, and then how did your emotions and actions affect you later? What were some of those consequences, right? Okay, so once you've completed that, um, let's take a look at that and discuss it a little bit more. As you reflect on this, can you think about if someone else was in your situation, um, could they have had a different emotional response? So maybe think about what other emotional responses someone else might have had in this same situation. Um, and if there were a different emotional response, would that have led to a different thought or action than yours? And the idea of this is, is thinking about, you know, the potential that having a different emotional reaction to the situation can lead to a different outcome. Um, So let's move on a little to this idea of an emotional battery. Um, so we each have a finite amount of emotional energy. We don't have endless energy, if only, right? Um, and every day it's different, right? So there are days when we can go with the flow and we can handle stressful situations without feeling overwhelmed. And then there are other days where we just feel exhausted and we're just getting by, um, or we are having these um, kind of more intense emotional reactions to things that we, we might not always have that reaction to. Um, so imagine that your emotional capacity is sort of like your phone battery. Um, take a moment right now and check in with how you're doing right now as you watch this video. What's your current emotional capacity level? How are you feeling? How much energy do you have? And then think about, you know, what are you like when you are fully charged? So when that phone battery of yours or emotional battery of yours is fully charged, what are you like? What are the warning signs that you're running low and close to empty? So what are some of those signs that you look for? You know, is it that you, be, you start feeling a little more irritable and start snapping at people around you? Um, is it that you start feeling really drained? Um, so what, thinking about what do you do when your phone has 20% battery left, let's say, and you don't have a charger with you, let's say you're out, um, what do you do? So maybe, for example, you choose not to use certain apps, you close some of your apps, um, you dim your screen's brightness, you find someone that you can borrow a charger from. So these are all ways that you deal with your um, phone battery being low, right? So shifting that to your emotional capacity, what can you do when you only have 20% of your emotional capacity left? So maybe you choose to hang out with a friend um, or to do something fun, or you choose to connect with someone and share your own struggles. Maybe you choose not um, to do something that you feel like would be really draining, uh, like, you know, talking to someone on the phone that you find um, difficult to, to talk with or be there for. And then going a little further, what happens when you're at 0% charge? What do you need to do to recharge? What gives you that kind of rejuvenation of your emotional capacity? Is it spending time in community? Um, is it being on your own and, you know, reading a book or um, taking a walk? So thinking about what you need in those, in those areas. Because in general, you know, to be able to, to give or be there for others, we also have to recharge ourselves. Um, so this is a necessary piece of that. Um, it's also connected to some of these more... Um, intense emotional reactions that we can have, right? Like if we are at a very low emotional battery and we're encountering a situation that can feel um, stressful for us, 
we might feel that even more if our emotional battery is low versus if we're, you know, at 80% charge. Okay, so let's move on to, um, this is the cognitive behavioral uh, model. So this, um, I apologize, this uh, graphic here is a little off center. <laughs> um, but this goes over sort of a situation. The situation is I lost my sweater. Um, and then thoughts, emotions, body sensations, and behaviors. Um, so the situation, I lost my sweater. And then the thoughts, I'm so absent-minded, I'm an idiot, no one cares about me. That can lead to emotions of feeling, let's say, frustrated, sad, um, maybe some shame. And then I, I feel my body sensations. I'm tense, I'm clenched. Um, I feel a heaviness in my chest. Um, my behaviors might be potentially that I, um, I might sulk, right? I might spend some time alone just getting caught up in my thoughts. Um, I might leave my friends. I might leave whatever situation I'm in because I'm not feeling good anymore. Okay. So the idea is that your, your emotions can impact your thoughts, body sensations, behaviors, and or your thoughts can impact these as well. So we have several areas that we can intervene in this model. So we have the thought area, um, which we can intervene by thinking of alternate perspectives. Um, so maybe instead of, of thinking I'm an idiot or no one cares about me, um, I could think, um, I could replace that with an alternate perspective of, um, you know, I made a mistake. Mistakes happen. Um, it's been a long time since I've lost something, you know, something like that, a way to kind of challenge some of that. Um, and that might lead to a change in some of the feelings that I have in some of the behaviors I might have, right? Like um, it might lead me to be a little more connected with others and maybe ask them to help me look for my sweater instead of leaving them. Okay. Um, the other area to intervene would be body sensations. Um, so our body sensations can impact our emotions and thoughts as well. So when, my, when I feel my body in getting tense and heavy and clenched and all those pieces, I can, I can try and soothe myself. Um, so it might be taking some deep breaths, might be um, trying to release some of that tension, um, might be doing some stretches. Okay, and that might impact the rest of this as well. Um, the other piece to intervene in is, is emotions, right? So recognizing that I'm not feeling great right now and these emotions will pass. Um, they will not last forever. So I can sort of use that, um, that idea of, of riding the wave. So I'm surfing out my emotions. They will pass eventually. Okay, so you might experiment a little with what feels the, the most effective or the most um, easy way to intervene within this model for you specifically. So maybe it's challenging your own thoughts or coming up with alternate perspectives. Maybe it's soothing your body. Um, maybe it's kind of being able to recognize that these emotions will pass. So finding what works best for you. Okay, so at the beginning we talked a little bit about um, reducing our vulnerability to those unpleasant emotions. So that, you know, is sort of connected to that emotional battery piece, but it's taking care of your mind by taking care of your body. Um, so we often live our lives without really thinking much about our body. Um, we might even spend a lot of time ignoring what our body is telling us. So like, I'm hungry or I'm tired. Um, and instead, we try to push through those physical sensations and feelings. Um, 
So in addition to recognizing how your thoughts and behaviors can influence your emotions, it's important to recognize how some of these other health um, pieces can influence how you feel. We often undervalue and overlook the importance of taking care of ourselves and our health um, when we think about ma managing our emotions. Um, our minds do take cues from our bodies as to whether we're okay or not. And so this is part of why we talk about those physical sensations as well. Um, and this is often unconscious. For example, if our body's needs are being neglected, the mind gets the message that we're not okay. Um, stress can really accumulate in our body, um, especially with chronic stress, right? And so it needs to be released and taken care of in that way. So for example, if you don't sleep well, you wake up for class late, you end up having to skip breakfast and you rush to class, um, but, but then you find um, that you're bus is running late or your car battery is dead, how might you feel in that situation? On the other hand, if you do get a good night of sleep, you're able to have breakfast, you have a lot of time to get to class, um, and then you find that your bus is running late or your car battery is dead, how might that feel a little bit different? Um, it might feel a little bit easier to manage some of those stressful situations when you have some of the physical health um, taken care of as that foundation. Um, so in your workbook, there's an appendix and it does have a lot of information about things like sleep hygiene, um, increasing positive emotions and engaging in some of those pleasant activities. So you can find that there um, if you do want more of those tips. These are on the screen, you can see some basic um, tips. So that first one is what we've already talked about, like physical health has an impact on emotional health. Treating physical illness if you do have it versus ignoring that. Um, making sure to balance your eating and eating mindfully. So that's um, kind of paying attention to your body's cues around are you hungry, are you full, um, and eating in that mindful way to, to make sure you're not ignoring your hunger or eating until you um, don't feel good. Then trying to avoid mood altering drugs, so alcohol um, or other drugs can have an impact on emotional health as well and physical health. Mm -hmm. um, trying to find an effective sleep schedule and getting that eight hours um, has a big impact on emotional health. Exercise is pretty huge for emotional health. Um, lots of studies around how exercise um, can impact depression and anxiety. Um, so all those are some of those basic pieces around um, physical health. Okay, so this next exercise that we're gonna work on is identifying some triggering thoughts. So like in the earlier CBT model, um, we talked about how thoughts can influence how you feel. In that earlier example, that thought about, I am so absent-minded, I'm an idiot, um, likely made this person feel worse about what they had done. Um, and this type of thought is called a triggering thought because it triggers that emotional pain and suffering that we feel. Um, so one emotion regulation skill is to learn how to deal with those, those thoughts when they do come up. Um, so that alternate perspective is one one way when we talked about the um, CBT model, and this is another way. Um, so some of these, these thoughts that tend to come up for us um, might be criticisms that we were told when we were children. Um, others might be some of these self-criticisms that we feel like might motivate us to be better in some way. Um, so take a look here. There's a list on the screen of some examples of um, possible triggering thoughts. So you can look at the list and check off any, any of these thoughts that might fit for you. Um, if not, try and think of some, some thoughts that you have that tend to be triggering. Um, if you have a hard time kind of thinking of what might be a triggering thought for you, maybe think back to the last time you felt upset or sad or anxious and try to remember some of the thoughts you might have had in that situation that made you feel a little bit more, um, a little bit worse in that situation. 
Okay. So take a moment to do that and identify that. You can pause this if you need to, to do a little bit more of that reflection. Um, but if not, we will move on to this idea of thought diffusion. Okay, so choose the triggering thought that you feel like you say the most to you yourself. Um, so kind of circle that and then take out a piece of paper and write it um, on the right hand side. So say that triggering thought to yourself a few times and get into the thought. And then take a minute to notice what emotions are coming up for you and what body sensations. Okay, what are you feeling in your body? What's that emotion or emotions that are coming up for you? Okay, and then once you do that, take a minute to write out a another sentence, which is, I'm having the thought that, and then insert the triggering thought. So it might be, I'm having the thought that I'm an idiot. And again, say that, that phrase to yourself a few times and get into that thought. Notice what emotions and body sensations come up for you um, with this new phrase. Okay. Anything different that you feel. Okay, and then try one last phrase, which is writing out the sentence, I notice that I'm having the thought that, and then insert the triggering thought. So it might be, I notice that I'm having the thought that I'm an idiot. So again, say that to yourself a few times and try to get into that thought and notice what emotions and body sensations come up for you with that new phrase. Okay, yeah, what are you feeling? What do you notice in your body? And just take a moment to reflect on that exercise. What do you notice? What do you notice coming up for you? What do you notice changing, if anything? This idea is a thought diffusion, so we're getting a little bit further away. So we're a little bit less connected to these thoughts with each of these new sentences. So I'm having the thought I notice. Um, it's the sense that I'm not that thought anymore. Um, so a lot of people might feel that with each new sentence, they felt a little bit further away. So a little bit less connected. Okay, and these are all really individual, so not everything's gonna work for you. Not everything's gonna work the first time. A lot of this takes practice and experimenting with, um, with what works. Okay, so yeah, the piece of language can be really important when we um, try to work on some of this. Okay, so we're gonna move on to a different idea, um, which is we're gonna watch this video called The Struggle Switch. Um, and the idea is that control at times can be the problem, not the solution. Um, so sometimes our attempts to control our emotions, those strategies might be um, part of the problem for us. If we feel really fixated on trying to control how we feel, we get kind of trapped in this cycle. Um, so it's, for example, it can be like this person falling into a pool of quicksand. The more the person struggles, the faster the quicksand um, takes them under. In quicksand, struggling can be um, the worst thing to do. The way to get out of it is to lie back spread your arms and float on the surface. It can be really hard um, because every instinct tells you to struggle, but if you do, you will go under. Um, 
And the same can be true for our overwhelming feelings. The more we try to fight them, um, the more they can tend to feel overwhelming. So let's watch this video together um, to illustrate a little bit more what we're talking about here. This is called The Struggle Switch by Dr. Russ Harris. Which goes on and we start to struggle with it. You know what? I just realized the sound wasn't on. Sorry about that. We're starting over. It often seems like we've got a struggle switch at the back of our mind. And as soon as an uncomfortable emotion, a painful feeling or memory shows up, it's like the, the struggle switch goes on and we start to struggle with it. So let's suppose anxiety shows up, a very common painful emotion that we all get to experience. Anxiety shows up, the struggle switch goes on. Oh, this anxiety, I don't like anxiety, I want to get rid of my anxiety. Now I've got anxiety about my anxiety. So it's getting bigger. With the struggle switch on, I now get, oh, my anxiety is getting bigger. How do I get rid of my anxiety? Now I've got even more anxiety. With the struggle switch on, I may then get angry about my anxiety. Why does this anxiety keep showing up? I hate this anxiety. And then I might even start to feel sad about my anger. Oh, is this my life? Oh, and then I may start to feel guilty about my sadness, about my anger. Oh, how pathetic am I when there's starving kids in Africa? So with my struggle switch on, my emotions get amplified. I've now got guilt about my sadness, about my anger, about my anxiety, about my anxiety. And that kind of amplification of emotions gives them more impact and influence over my life and often gets me bogged down or pulls me into self-defeating behaviors. Now, what happens if I can switch off the struggle switch? With the struggle switch off, anxiety shows up, and it's not that I like it or want it or approve of it, it's just I'm not going to struggle with it. I'm not going to invest my time, energy, and effort in struggling with this anxiety. Instead, I'm going to invest it in doing meaningful, life-enhancing activities, such as spending quality time with my friends and family, playing with my kids. Now, with the struggle switch off, the anxiety is free to move. It may get higher, it may get lower, it may move quickly, it may move slowly, but the point is it's free to move. It doesn't get amplified by all of these other emotions, which make it kind of bigger and stickier and make it hang around for a lot longer. So there's no such thing as a life without anxiety. It shows up for all of us. But when anxiety shows up and the struggle switch is off, it's so much easier to live with when the struggle switch is off. Do you sometimes find? Okay, thank you for going through all that with me today. Um, and that is all for our emotion regulation section. Thanks for going through the Wise Mind practice series with us. We hope you um, learned and enjoyed the series. Um, feel free to reach out to the Counseling Center if you have any questions or concerns about any of the sessions. All right, take care.